Like, listen to Gary from Nerdrotic talk about Lord of the Rings. That's a guy who understands the universe. These people that are weaponizing identity politics know nothing about it. And it drives them crazy because they are being outclassed by regular people sitting in their houses, in their bedrooms, in their pool house, or wherever. Because we have passion, because we're interested, and because we care. So Amazon's Lord of the Rings, today was a very, very fun day. So I guess it's anti-SJW coverage week on my channel because we talked about them finally collabing with Ben Shapiro in both Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers and Ryan Kinnell collabing with The Daily Wire. But today, I guess you thought this video may have been coming. They are outraged again about woke and Lord of the Rings has gone woke with its new Amazon show and these guys already hate it. They say it is like SJW nonsense and leftist propaganda, despite the fact there has literally been like no footage shown. The show is not out. Why do you think they are so outraged? Oh, because some of the cast are played by minority actors. All this stuff is always expected and always seems to happen these days. To be honest, I think the reaction to this has been a lot more insane than usual because the Lord of the Rings subreddit has like descended into civil war and there are genuinely people talking about the show's casting being an insult to Anglo-Saxon culture. No, I am not joking. So today what I wanted to do was go through the massive insane backlash. Then I wanted to talk about the civil war on the Lord of the Rings subreddit. And then from that, I want to bounce into the Anglo-Saxon stuff. So you guys might have remembered two videos I made before talking about Anglo-Saxon and how it's used in the United States compared to the UK. But also in my video about Lord of the Rings and especially about Camp Hobbit, that fash camp influenced by the Lord of the Rings and inspired by like Evola type ideology and talk about how people who want to protect Anglo-Saxon culture often find a home with Tolkien's work in part because it's very much inspired by Anglo-Saxon history and Tolkien for all like his good views on things like South Africa and Germany in World War II. I do find his massive obsession with Anglo-Saxon culture versus the Norman invasion to be very, very weird, especially considering his family were like German migrants in the 1700s. I mean, I guess the Anglo-Saxons were from like Germany and Northern Europe, but a lot of people often use it as like a stand-in for English now. But we're gonna talk about all of that in the video. So Valentine's Day is coming up on Monday, and if there is something I am known for on the internet, it's being a hopeless romantic. So Yaniv, Megna wants to wish you a happy Valentine's Day to her favorite data kiss. I hope you guys both have like a really, really nice day. And thank you for watching my content. If you're watching it together, I'm sure it brings your relationship even closer. Also, Yaniv, I hear you're a big supporter of United as well, just like me. And, you know, it's quite hard supporting United at the moment. Just Drew with Burnley, like, come on, how are we doing that? And hopefully we win tomorrow. If you're watching this later, I hope we've won already. And I also hope you're both watching this over a candlelit dinner on Monday, the 14th of February. Also, just because I normally plug this, all my social medias, Patreon, all that stuff in the description. So let's now move on to the drama. So Vanity Fair had the exclusive reveal of the new Lord of the Rings Amazon show. Honestly, I'm not hyped for this at all. I do like Lord of the Rings quite a bit. Like I read the books growing up. I read all the like Middle Earth books growing up. I don't think I understood most of them because I was so young. But I think the show generally looks quite bad. It sounds like it's gonna be bad based on the people who are involved. I also think it's following a really weird trend from the Wheel of Time and the Witcher where these fantasy shows just look god awful CGI and look way too clean. And also, the actors they often pick seem like they are English actors who all went to theatre school 
and are doing like their posh accents they use to you know perform plays and stuff i know a lot of the original lord of rings cast also went to theater school and did like shakespeare like ian mckellen but i think more modern fantasy like game of thrones the witcher games and even the assassin's creed games what I think they do very well to make themselves authentic is they use lots of different regional English accents to make it feel like more gritty. While things like The Witcher Show and Wheel of Time, loads of people just have the most posh English accent. I think it really takes you out of it. And like, if we can have everyone in fantasy sound like the Bloody Baron from The Witcher 3, I think that'd be a massive improvement. 20 years we've known each other. She's seen me drunk and sober. She was there to greet me when I returned the victor. She was there to patch me up in defeat. A Vanity Fair reporting. Amazon's show, which debuts on Prime Video on September 2nd, is based not on a Tolkien novel per se, but on the vast backstory he laid out in the appendices to the Lord of Rings trilogy. Five seasons will likely cost the studio well over $1 billion. That kind of budget might decimate most other studios, but Tolkien, like space travel, is a personal obsession for Jeff Bezos, who's among the richest people in the world. This is a big ticket business venture that will allow him to create the most expensive elaborate TV series ever made. While Jackson is not connected to the project, his movies, as well as the spiritual successor Game of Thrones, prove that there's a massive audience for immersive fantasy. Of course, many have tried to capture that same audience and few have survived survived or thrived. The showrunners Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne are agonizingly aware of this pressure. Their series will juggle 22 stars and multiple storylines from deep within the dwarf mines of the Misty Mountains to the high politics of the elven kingdom of Linden and the human's powerful Atlantis-like island Numenor. All this will center eventually around the incident that gives the trilogy its names, the forging of the ring, says McKay. Rings for the elves, rings for the dwarves, rings for the men, and the one ring Sauron used to deceive them all. It's a story of the creation of all those powers, where they came from, and what they did to each of those races. The driving question behind this production, he adds, was this. Can we come up with a novel Tolkien never wrote and do it as a mega event series? That could only happen now. So that doesn't really sound too bad in theory, but there is a lot of screenshots of the various cards members that are released and of course this is what set the anti-SJWs off. So here is the first one, the Dwarven Princess Disa, played by Sophia Nomvetti, standing at the Khazad Doom's entrance. So obviously she's a dwarf, also played by a black actress. People are also mad that she didn't appear to have a beard. And even female dwarfs in Lord of Rings have beards. I think you can kind of zoom in and see kind of mutton chops, but I'm not too sure. Um, so another one, the Sylvan Elf Arondir, played by Ishmael Cruz Cordova, is a character who has been created by the series. So obviously another character played by a black actor. He also has short hair. So a lot of people were pretty butthurt about elves not having short hair anymore. As we all know, when you are showing the world a made up fantasy realm, it must only have white characters in it. There are no such thing as black elves or black dwarves or anything like that. That can't happen because in the made up world that doesn't exist, these things also can't exist, apparently. So before we go any further, let's get to some anti-SJWs. I would say crying, but they seem to be gloating a lot here and talking about, like, how this has already been ruined and it's already leftist SJW propaganda and people are finally rejecting the nonsense of Hollywood. Amazon's Lord of the Rings is set up to be a complete and total disaster beyond belief. And we've been telling you this was going to happen and the media is falling right into it because they are so predictable. It is so easy to predict exactly how these NPCs are going to respond. And, you know, for the people out there that are saying, well, we're just, you know, we're taking full advantage of this and we're trying to gain subs and get views and all of that to confirm, yes, that is 100% accurate. Absolutely. Hollywood deserves to be mocked and shamed for how they are treating franchises and fans. They do not like you. They do not respect you. It is nothing more than identity politics propaganda meant to say you, if you don't like this, you're an ist in an ism. You're part of toxic fans. Uh, Slash Film is another one. Slash Film puts this tweet up. Oh, shame. It seems racists won't be able to watch the new Lord of the Rings TV show. Well, they deleted it. I made my response where I just simply said Trump 2024. That's all I'm going to start saying to these people. You're not going to weaponize my political opinion. Absolutely not. I will own it over and over again and be proud of it. 
Because the more you try to shame me for my opinion, the more I'm going to show you how proud of it I am. Because they only define you off of your race and gender and how good of a narrative they can build around it. Ask Candace Owens how she's treated by the left. I told you in my first video earlier today that if you didn't like Lord of the Rings, what were they going to call you? They were going to call you all the worst things in the book, and it's already begun. Twitter is already absolutely loaded with people who are having a meltdown over anybody criticizing the idea that, you know, dwarves lived underground and that, you know, dwarves were white in Tolkien's book and there's lore to support it. The main criticism is that it's lazy. If you want to have an Asian dwarf, have at it, but you better have the lore to support it. You don't just toss them in there and say, yeah, there's Asian dwarves now. That's what people push back against. So Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers actually seems a bit more unhinged than usual. Tweeting Trump 2024 at people talking about the new Lord of Rings show. I don't really understand what his problem is. Talking about how it's just part of his agenda and they're using minorities to push their agenda, which is I don't really understand what the agenda is. Of course, Jeremy often doesn't say the conclusion on his entertainment channel. He leaves that for his other channel. The other Jeremy twin um, is talking about like the law justification. Like, where is it in the law? Where is it in the law? Why are these guys such like nerds? And the problem I have with this stuff is like, this isn't the first time the Lord of Rings has been translated to another medium. Maybe, not that I'd agree with it, maybe I could understand the arguments a bit more like in terms of the source material if it had never been translated before. But the problem is the Lord of Rings trilogy is literally like one of the most successful series of films that has ever been created. You're never going to see a fantasy like genre film get like 12 Oscars ever again. And of course, these films are beloved by people and they've spawned like various video games and the main point is these guys will say well where are the black dwarfs in the source material where are like the minorities in the source material if you guys actually love the law of all the rings as someone who's read the books there is so much important stuff that is cut out of the films characters kind of changed literally the whole ending of the third lord of the rings film is completely different from the actual ending of the book. I really, really doubt you've ever gone crying about how there isn't a big battle scene in the Shire at the end of the Return of the King because you don't actually care about the lore. I doubt you've gone crying about how Fellowship doesn't have Tom Bombadil, who is like a very important character in the lore of Lord of the Rings. You guys don't care about the lore you only care about the law when it can maybe back up a point you're making about your own bigoted prejudices where you want to keep people excluded from this franchise. Because in reality, Tolkien is like a product of his time. I talked about this a lot in my old video. He is probably going to write his books that way. But can you not adapt this? How does a dwarf being black or white or how does an elf being black or white? change anything they're these like immortal beings like why would anyone care about the race of these characters so now i want to get into some of the backlash on social media and mainly talk about like the civil war going on in the lord of rings subreddit before we get into the totally ridiculous stuff about attacks on anglo-saxon culture which i never get tired of debunking so here is loads of anti-sjw right wingers trying to cope on the lord of rings subreddit it only felt natural to us that an adaptation of Tolkien's work would reflect what the world actually looks like, says Lindsay Webber, executive producer of the series, and that is what we'll get, not Middle-earth, our world dressed up as Middle-earth. They just admitted adapting Middle-earth isn't their priority. They want to adapt Manhattan and Los Angeles, I guess because those are melting pot cities. If you want to watch it, I suggest waiting for the fan edition to cut out all the hobbits and the illogical diversity the same way they cut out Toria. This stuff is so, so pathetic. The new show is going to be trash. Nobody working on the new show cares about the actual Lord of the Rings universe. It's just another theme park cash grab designed to feast of a franchise that ended long ago. Character races are changing just to be woke and inclusive. Sets and costumes look like some student made garbage and I guarantee the story is going to be mindlessly boring and poorly written at 140 upvotes. So there's another post uh, about Disney's Aladdin. Look at how the casting of Disney's Aladdin was treated to ensure that it was culturally authentic and compare that to how Amazon treats Lord of the Rings. The one thing I want to say about this point I keep seeing and it's about like, oh, you wouldn't cast like a white Black Panther. The problem is the film industry has 
historically been dominated by white people from the UK and from the US. Most stories told have been about like white countries' histories, white countries' cultures. Being culturally sensitive when it comes to minority groups and other countries that never have had much time on the screen is far different than diversifying a cast from modern diverse nations. So one of the comments is like a big mask off moment for a lot of these people. In part, I think it is whoever complains the most gets their way. In part, it's American plastic culture and cultural imperialism, but mainly anti-white racism, which is festering in the US. Someone else chiming in, it's blatant bigotry. Bigotry against what? It's culturally insensitive, okay? Tolkien, as a scholar, wrote The Lord of the Rings as an explicit act of culture appreciation for the indigenous natives of England, the Anglo-Saxons. I mean, how poor does your reading of history have to be that you think the Anglo-Saxons who migrated to Britain in 400 AD were the natives of England? In that admission, the guy is basically admitting he knows nothing about history because one of the most famous landmarks in the UK is Hadrian's Wall made by the Romans who owned Britain and owned England for like 400 years. So we're going to get back to the awful history these people often subscribe to and why they latch onto Tolkien. But here is a fan who is really disappointed in the massive backlash on the subreddit. So following up on all the hubbub regarding the Rings of Power from a different perspective. Hey guys, I'm sure a lot of you are fed up to the teeth regarding the Rings of Power discourse surrounding race. I am as well, but not because of the amount of discussion around it, but because it's honestly making me want to walk further away from my favorite set of books and mythological world of all time. A world that kept me going when I was a young kid who got bullied a lot because he looked different. Reed Brown in a very white Irish, white American town. Eight different things. As a brown kid who moved to the US fairly young, this was the first world I ever found I could escape to. It was a world where the people, at least the majority of them, were good, truly good. They valued honor and trust and friendship and bravery. It's disheartening to see so many here go up in arms about diversity and color in a show. How many Asian or Indian movies have you guys seen where the main character magically ends up being someone like Keanu Reeves? I haven't heard a peep from any of these same people about that. You know what will annoy me if I make Shelob a super sexy woman or change the map around or create ridiculous plot lines when the man himself created over 6,000 years of stories. If you've got such an issue with seeing non-white people on screen, just ask yourself where that issue was when you spent the last 30 years only seeing token brown, black and Asian people on screen. If you didn't care at all, then honestly, that is a personal issue for you and not one anyone else is going to solve. So that is a very nice post and shows how much these stories are like universal and mean a lot to different people, despite the fact they're made by, you know, a white English guy born in South Africa who wrote a lot of these stories based on Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon history. But here is a very nice comment that plays more into the stuff about it being like Anglo-Saxon erasure. Sorry you don't feel represented, but this is Anglo-Saxon culture. And while I'm sure your culture has many stories that exclusively feature your own race and little to no Europeans, so do ours. Diversity does not mean mixing all cultures until it's one big blob. It means enjoying the different stories, music, foods, and all the delights one has to offer without trying to muddle and mix it into others. So one more comment on this thread, which um, echoes a lot of my points from earlier. My main problem is, is that deep inside, I don't think it's really a matter of respect to Tolkien's lore. The sub seems to have been mainly pro-Jackson for years, until very recently you couldn't make a single comment with even a slight criticism of how Jackson changed or misunderstood Tolkien's lore or intent without being heavily downvoted, and people would jump at your throat and say it's an adaptation and Jackson's vision not meant to be a one-for-one -one copy. Now the same sub did a 180 and suddenly everyone here wants a 100% faithful adaptation. What is funny that among all the subs and forums and servers I'm a member of, Lord of the Rings is the most pro-Jackson yet and it's the only one where I've seen the amount of negative reactions to the extent of insult or more specialized forums, even the ones with actual scholars, people have been way more nuanced with an overall more positive attitude and are saddened by the reactions they see here. So yeah, the idea that the same people will at the same time praise Jackson for his adaptation and shit on the new show rubs me the wrong way. If you consider Jackson's treatment of Frodo's arc or Denifor, Faramir, Faramir, plenty of other characters or general themes to be a positive thing and at the same time you have a problem with a black actor being cast, it is sad to say but the chances are the respect of the law isn't what motivates you. So to be fair, like Lord of Rings memes was heavily upvoting posts that were memeing the situation. So here's 
one of uh, Smeagol. So me, not white, waiting for the show. Seeing people who look like you in an adaptation of your favorite fantasy series, Toxic Fans in the subreddit. So another one, can this subreddit just not? I hope the new Lord of Rings series is good, as long as it is well written. Wokeness alert. Wokeness is destroying Lord of Rings. This There could be women and minorities. Wokeness is destroying our peaceful fandom. Lord of Rings is ruined forever. So of course, like one guy thinking Anglo-Saxons were like the indigenous population of Britain is very laughable. Another guy saying like, it's erasing Anglo-Saxon culture. This stuff is totally ridiculous. But why do these people come out of the woodwork to talk about Anglo-Saxon culture in regards to Lord of the Rings? So let's get into Tolkien's work and how he has weird views about Anglo-Saxons and why this is a home to people. I actually want to do one more thing quickly to show you other ridiculous comments I've got about this before on my Anglo-Saxon video. So I'm proud to be an Anglo-Saxon. Every other race is proud of their origins and they are encouraged to celebrate it. So I will as well. Nobody will ever change my feelings on that. I'm proud of my Norse and Anglo-Saxon and Celtic and Norman and Roman history, my family bloodline. Don't know how you would ever work that out. But as a proud Anglo-Saxon, I'm disheartened by people that hijack the term for racial purpose. I mean, if you're describing yourself as Anglo-Saxon, you have bought into the racialization of the term. But now let's go into Tolkien's like obsession with this stuff. So an Anglo-Saxon in Middle-earth. In an early version of J.R.R. Tolkien's stories, the tales of Middle-earth are brought to our world by Otto, I don't even have to say that second word, who would go on to be the father of both the author of Beowulf and the Anglo-Saxon invaders of Britain. Frame story in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and Lord of Rings is a simple one. The novels we are read are, supp are supposedly taken from Bilbo Baggins' own account, The Red Book of Westmarch, but much earlier in Tolkien's writing career, he conceived of a very different frame story, one that would tie Middle-earth to our modern Earth and to an imaginary history of Britain itself. In Tolkien's early writings, a Germanic sailor named Otto sets out from Heligoland in northern Germany. He is shipwrecked on a distant island. An old man guides him to some elves who tell him stories of Middle-earth. The old man turns out to be one of the Valor, the gods, the angels of Middle-earth. The elf grants the sailor the name Elfriend. After Elfriend returns to the normal world, he has has three sons. Two of them in Tolkien's mythology are Hengist and Horsa, who we're going to get back to, actual historical figures who led the Germanic invasion of Britain, the ones that put the Saxon in Anglo-Saxon, in other words. The third, Berenda, would go on to write the classic of Anglo-Saxon literature, Beowulf, and also carry the stories of the elves and Middle-earth onto us. Tolkien conceived of his Middle-earth stories as a kind of imagined history for Britain, a saga to match the Great Norse and Icelandic sagas. The elf friend frame story did not carry into the works published in his lifetime, but appears in the books compiled by his son Christopher. And I talk a bit more into why people like project this thing as like some sort of bastion of this made up thing, Anglo-Saxon culture, which apparently still exists. For Tolkien, Anglo-Saxon was the heart of Englishness and the Norman conquest initiated the shameful decay of that noble tongue by introducing continental borrowings and other forms of linguistic pollution. He felt that the defeat of the Saxon King Harold by the Normans at the Battle of Hastings as a fresh wound and he held this against the French language and culture to the end of his days. So that is very, very weird for a guy born like 800 and something years later to see the battle of hastings as a tragedy i mean like there are hints like xenophobia in that outlook but I, again i find it very very bizarre and i think it plays into the racialization of the term anglo-saxon but a really good post on tolkien fans six years ago tolkien's despair over hastings i've heard here and there that tolkien always hated william the conqueror and how he bested king harold at the battle of hastings in 1066 because it prevented a full flourishing of, of anglo-saxon culture and allowed the french to pollute the language so it goes on to say the great google led me to all of this but no direct quotes from the man himself Tolkien felt that his true culture had been crushed and forgotten. While still a schoolboy, he gave a debate club speech opposing the Norman conquest. From the skull and Hammond, the J.R.R. Tolkien companion and guide, Tolkien's antagonism to France, the French and the French language was due in large part to his regret that English culture was dislocated and nearly destroyed following the conquest of England by French-speaking Normans in 1066. A straight dope forum led me to this J.R.R. Tolkien encyclopedia entry. 
For Tolkien, the Norman Conquest prevented the survival of a distinctly English language and corrupted the idea of English life. Indeed, the very lexicon Tolkien uses in his own fiction seeks to moderate the linguistic impact of the Conquest. Throughout his work, he employs primarily words of Germanic derivation over ones of more recent French or Latin origin. So I find it weird, like anyone talking about like they wish Anglo-Saxon culture could flourish and that was like the true English like spirit of England and culture not mentioning of course like the indigenous natives of England and their culture has largely been completely erased by various different groups migrating to England itself so I would hardly hold up the Anglo-Saxons as like the true English considering they came after like 400 years of Latin rule by the Romans. So then saying like the Normans brought back like the Latin language and like polluted the language. I feel like it's a very, very weird thing to be obsessed with, even for someone like Tolkien, but I'm gonna get into in a bit. People are obsessed with Anglo-Saxon culture because how the term was made into like this race in the 16th century during like the birth of modern racism as we understand it, where the English and Northern Europeans saw themselves as like racially pure the true christians compared to peoples of the mediterranean like, like the spanish or the italians who had darker features often darker skin and they weren't seen as pure because obviously they had lived under arab muslim conquests and also the term anglo-saxon is just like pretty ridiculous because the angles and the saxons are not even the same group of people and it also like erases the jutes from it as well so i've been reading a really really good book lately there's three of these books and they're like these long form history books about the world this one is called the history of the medieval world by susan wise bauer and i would seriously recommend it but i just want to read you the passage about how the Anglo saxons and jutes actually came to england because i want to use this to frame the tolkien stuff but I also want to talk about it to completely reject this belief that there's somehow people who can kind of trace their lineage back to the Anglo-Saxons, if that term even makes sense at all. So chapter 25, Elected Kings. The chapter before talks about like Irish pirate invasions of England and incursions by the Picts from Scotland. So in the face of all this chaos, the minor kings and tribal chiefs of Britain gathered together in council in which they elected the northern king Vortigern as their war leader. Desperation, Vortigern suggested that the remaining British soldiers bolster their ranks with their Saxon allies. The British could allow more Saxon settlements in the south, particularly in Essex and in Kent, in exchange for tribute warriors who would help them to fight against the Picts and the Irish. The other chiefs agreed, and so Vortigern sent messages not only to the Saxons on the distant North Sea coast, just west of Denmark, also to their allies, the Angles, who lived just northeast of the Saxons on the dividing line between Germany and Denmark. But at first, the strategy seemed to be working. The Angles and Saxons accepted the invitation, and around 445 AD, they sailed across the water to join the British in their fight against the Picts. They fought against the enemy who attacked from the north, and the Saxons won the victory. In return, Vortigern granted the Allies settlement rights in Kent. The Saxons and Angles, once established in the Greenland of Kent, did not stay nicely in the granted land. They had amb ambitions to spread farther. In a matter of months, new shiploads of their countrymen, along with the Jutes, allies of the Angles who lived in the Danish peninsula, were arriving on the southeastern shores in longships. Vortigern had crushed the northern menace, and in doing so had created a southern invasion, led by the two Saxon brothers who we talked about with the Tolkien stuff, named Hengis and Horsa. The Jutes occupied the southern coast, the Saxons moved from Kent farther inland to the south and southwest of Londinium, and the Angles invaded the southeastern coast just above the Thames. Destruction reigned, all the major towns were laid low. The British tribes, allied behind Vortigern, spent six years fighting fruitlessly against the invaders. The invaders seemed unstoppable. In 455, Vortigern finally managed to defeat the invaders in a pitched battle on the fords of the Medway River in Kent. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that Horsa was killed. The loss of one of their chiefs forced the invaders to regroup, and for a few brief moments, Vortigern must have had wild hopes of victory. But Horsa's son took up his father's mantle, and the balance tipped back. For the next 15 years, war continued. 
each year seeing a new and violent conflict between Vortica and his men and newcomers, neither side gaining the advantage and neither side willing to come to terms. So that is the beginning of the Anglo-Saxon invasion of England. And you can already see there that England is a melting pot before the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes come over to England. So they obviously migrate in massive numbers, but there are still loads of people who live in England. There are Celts, there are Romanized Celts, there are just like straight up Romans left behind after a lot of them left and the administration disintegrated. There are Irish pirates, the beginnings of the Welsh kingdoms as well, and of course the Picts who are various different tribes. So Britain as a whole is like a massive melting pot which the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes come into, they eventually become the ruling class. But if we're talking about like genetics or even like lineage and stuff, it's ridiculous to say that you are an Anglo-Saxon because what does that even mean? If you took your lineage back and it stayed in Britain somehow for like the last 2000 years, you wouldn't really be tracing your lineage back to the Saxons and even like your relatives who lived under the rule of the Saxons, probably wouldn't have been related to them. The Norman invasion is 1066, but Scandinavian Vikings literally owned like half of England for over a hundred years and settled it and completely combined with the local populations there, including the Saxon ones. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla Discovery Tour, if you go to Jorvik, it shows you all these engravings where Christians accept like the pagan gods or the Vikings accept Jesus Christ as a new god for their pantheon and it shows the blending of cultures. Of course, there's like marriages between them and all these different groups coming together. Like I said, England is this massive melting pot. So anyone who's like thinking the Norman conquest that re-brought like Latin languages back is destroying English culture is really, really weird. But even if you took that seriously, the belief that like there is some sort of Anglo-Saxon culture that is preserved by Tolkien is pretty ridiculous because you've bought into the racialization of this term. Now, I've spoken a lot about the racialization of this term, so just giving you a brief summary of how this developed. So the origins of racial Anglo-Saxonism in Great Britain before 1850, so before Tolkien was born, although a belief in Anglo-Saxon racial superiority was a vital ingredient in English and American thought of the 19th century, the study of this belief has been largely neglected. The best work is that of L.P. Curtis, who in studying anti-Irish prejudice in the second half of the 19th century has analyzed far broader aspects of Anglo-Saxonism. Curtis points out that this Anglo-Saxonism of the middle and late 19th century was far different from the earlier 16th and 17th century adulation of the Anglo-Saxon period as a golden age of free institutions. A belief in Anglo-Saxon freedom once used to defend popular liberties had by the middle of the 19th century been transformed into a rationale for the domination of peoples throughout the world. The heyday of Anglo-Saxonism came in the late 19th century when Tolkien was born, but the essential transformation had occurred earlier. Although Curtis has effectively analyzed aspects of Anglo-Saxonism in the last half of the 19th century, little detailed attention has been devoted to the process by which an earlier stress on Anglo-Saxon liberties was by 1850 transformed into a racist doctrine. The myth of Anglo-Saxon England had its origins in the 16th century. The break with Rome and the creation of the English church simulated an interest in the primitive Anglo-Saxon church. Reformers wished to demonstrate that England was merely returning to older, purer religious practices dating from before the Norman conquest practices which had been lost in subsequent centuries. So although it was a bit of a long-winded way to get there, I hope that little passage there outlines how Tolkien would have viewed these things through the lens of like just general racism at the time. Seeing the Norman conquest out of all the things that happened in English history as the one like really, really bad thing that happens and like destroys the culture, destroys the Anglo-Saxon institutions. But as you can see just from that little excerpt, this is essentially pure fantasy. And if you know your Anglo-Saxon history, you will know that at various times, the Saxon hold on England was very, very small in the wake of like the Viking dominance. And actually a lot of the Kings of England used to be subservient to Kings from Scandinavia who actually owned the whole of England. So then it's not surprising that Tolkien has taken a mythicized view of history, which was very influential in the time he was born and grew up in. And people today, like especially Americans who still believe that they are Anglo-Saxons in a lot of places, they use Lord of the Rings as like a stand-in for their prejudices. And that's why a lot of people 
are so hostile to the works of Tolkien being adapted to include non-Anglo-Saxons. And in my last video, we talked a lot about how Lord of Rings is often like a blank slate for politics, but there you can also see like how the traditionalism of Evola can be put on to something like the Shire, because if the whole work of Lord of Rings is inspired by a mythicized view of history of the Anglo-Saxon period, obviously fascist Italians who believe in like this purity stuff are gonna kind of like piggyback onto that for their own views. So the belief that the new Amazon show is an attack on Anglo-Saxon culture just shows you people who are like insanely racist. You believe in like this Anglo-Saxon myth, which puts people from Northern Europe and England and Scandinavia literally on the top of this like, you know, obviously made up racial pyramid where you're even like looking down on other white groups of people. Of course, like the Germans believe the same stuff. They called the British Anglo-Saxons during the war as well. They felt there was like some common history between them that they could like side together with where they didn't have that with the Slavs. So yeah, overall very, very niche. But if people are talking about like changes to Lord of Rings being an attack on Anglo-Saxon culture, it's because Tolkien's views on Anglo-Saxon culture were influenced by the politicization and the racialization of Anglo-Saxon as a term. You know, Tolkien was a very smart guy. He knew his history very, very well. But the politicization of history is something that still goes on today with various different subjects. He was not immune to stuff like that happening in the era he lived in. If you guys know anyone who describes themselves as an Anglo-Saxon, I'd be very curious to know like what they're like as a person. So stick that down in the comments. Follow me on social media at The Cavernacle on Twitter and on Instagram. Come join our communities on my Discord and my subreddit and consider supporting my work on Patreon. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.